Certain sub-genres of fiction can often have the largest appeal to me. Anything dystopian, for example, even though it's a little too close to reality nowadays, will draw my attention. Anything historical, too, especially with medieval history, will pique my interest. However, a fiction sub-genre that I loved as a teenager, and that I've been thinking more about lately, is the mecha. You know, it's those stories that revolve around giant, uber-powerful mechs doing stylized battle in ruined city streets, or coursing across the stars with a laser sword in hand. For a period of my young life, I couldn't get enough of it. At that time, Gundam Wing was a popular show on Toonami in the USA, and I was enthralled with the universe. I bought a few of the different Gundam series DVDs and painted some Gundam Wing models too. A few mecha games stuck out to me in this time as well, notably on the Dreamcast of all places. A friend and I played the hell out of Gundam Side Story 0079 Rise from the Ashes. This game with a mouthful of a title allowed you to play from a first-person perspective inside a Gundam mech that you could outfit with different weapons and armor pieces. It had a wonderful arcade feel to it, and even though it was a short playthrough, my friend and I would replay it over and over and over again, trying to one-up each other's scores and unlock new parts. Mech Assault was another earlier game that I couldn't get enough of, and it was actually the first game I bought with my OG Xbox when I saved up enough money to buy one used. This one was a little different, with a third-person perspective playing like an over-the-shoulder shooter. It again had the customizable mechs and lots of big explosions, and it was actually one of the first games to have Xbox Live support too, meaning it has a place in gaming history, even outside of its very positively reviewed gameplay. Of course there were many more games like this. You had the Armored Core series in Zone of the Enders, there was Mech Warriors on the PC, and an oddly titled game called Virtual On Ontario Tangram for the Dreamcast that I remember playing quite a bit of. There is, however, another long-running series of mech video games that first appeared on the Super Famicom, though my own experience with the series wouldn't be until many years later, and that's the Front Mission series. I started playing Front Mission in its third main series game, Front Mission 3, which was released in 2000 for the PS1. This is actually the first chance we Americans got to play a Front Mission game, as it was the first of the series released outside of Japan. I never forgot the game though, being that it tied together my young fascination of the mecha genre and love for tactical RPGs, and nowadays brings me nice nostalgic remembrances of long Saturdays spent grinding away on the PS1. I started collecting some Super Famicom games maybe three years ago when I got a Retron 5 and was able to put some translation patches together, and this is when I rediscovered Front Mission. The series began on the Super Famicom, and because of the wonderful development of these translation patches, these Super Famicom Front Mission games can be thoroughly enjoyed by an American audience. Front Mission on the Super Famicom was a game I just really couldn't put down. It completely captured my attention. And then when I started to research the game specifically, I started to find out about its really rich backstory and long development cycle with a lot of interesting people involved. I thought it'd be a really good game to look at, even though it's a game that many may not have played because it's not incredibly common over here in North America outside of its Nintendo DS release, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Some introduction out of the side though, let's look at the world of Front Mission some of its development and gameplay, and then its odd follow-up on the Super Famicom, Front Mission Gun Hazard. As you can no doubt tell, this is a very long and in-depth video, so I encourage you, if you like what you see throughout, to break it up by the timestamps I put in the description. Or otherwise, grab a nice frosty drink, relax, and jump in with me to look at Front Mission on the Super Famicom.
Being that the Front Mission universe has grown to be pretty large and spanned decades of releases, we should start by looking through some of the recurring story and gameplay elements that make it up. It is important to note though that there are many offshoots or alternative timeline games in the series, so what we'll look at now fits mostly with the numbered Front Mission games, but still also the universe as a whole, for the most part at least. The games are set in a real, yet fictionalized future world, with the series beginning in the year 2090. When creating the game, the real world was used as an inspiration, but Front Mission was not meant to shine light on or comment on current events. It simply grew as a piece of speculative fiction about what the world, and as an extension of this war and geopolitics, might be like 100 years on from when the game was being developed. In this world, most countries have unified, forming massive blocks that contain many individual countries within them. These often conflicting entities form much of the good guy, bad guy friction as they engage in wars and subterfuge. A few of the main ones that recur often are the Oceana Cooperative Union, the OCU, which contains countries from Southeast Asia, Oceania, and Australia, the United States of the New Continent, the USN, which is North and South America together, and the European Community, which brings together the European countries and closely resembles the real-world European Union. In Front Mission 1, the OCU and the USN are the two main factions. Throughout all of the games, players pilot mechs called Wanzers, which has a distinctive German sound to it and is indeed derived from the German word Wunderpanzer, which means walking tank. Wanzers are meant to be extensions of the human pilot and reflect on the skills of the people who use them. The developers wanted the machinery and weapons to be plausible and for human skill to define how effective the weapons are. A developer for Front Mission 1 had this to say about the world. He said, For me, it's more that I enjoy imagining what our near future might look like. Robotics, like everything else, will eventually be used for weapons and armaments, so we tried to portray that in a plausible way. And thus, as with any weapon, humans will use them, and the abilities of the individual humans will determine how effective the weapons are. From a design or artistic perspective, one thing that's visible in all of the games is a focus on gritty realism. The Wanzers are utilitarian and simple, colored with greens, grays, blacks, and browns, rather than being the ornate, color-rich killing machines you might find in Gundam. Video footage from the Vietnam War and motifs from blockbuster sci-fi movies like Alien were used to create some of the imagery and coloration of the game, and to inject the series with realism and believability. The characters reflect this as well, falling into a familiar trope of being somewhat normal people thrust into extreme situations. Front Mission games will generally feature a pretty diverse and international cast of characters and paramilitary soldiers that are forced to bear witness to the brutal machinations of history happening all around them. The games usually have story elements that revolve around a small personal band of characters that are fighting against overwhelming odds. Bringing a few of these pieces together, everything from the detailed customization of the games to the deep and story-rich world and gritty realism, makes Front Mission appeal to what the developers call the more hardcore gamer. Because of this, the games often have more mature subject matter, higher learning curve, and slower pacing than traditional Square games. And all of this also led neatly to the games playing out as tactical RPGs instead of a more action-oriented RPG style of other Square games at the time. Much of the background of the world that the games inhabit was built as part of the development for Front Mission 1 and expanded over the years of sequels. In researching the first Front Mission game, I quickly realized that everything the developers wanted to achieve came out of a desire to create a compelling human drama with realistic characters inhabiting an interesting and symbolic world. The art style, gameplay, dialogue, and characters themselves all build towards these goals. 
The passion for the project is evident too from all those involved, with every aspect of the game having a purpose and foundational idea behind it. Front Mission 1 began as an idea pitch from Square from a small development company called G-Craft. Because the game was, throughout the initial planning documents and original ideas, meant to be a hardcore game, G-Craft did not think that Square would approve, but to their amazement, it ended up going pretty well. Producer, creator, and head writer Toshiro Tsushida commented on the initial pitch of the idea for Front Mission, saying, I had a planning document I'd made for a game called Hundred Mission, and through the introduction of a third party, I was able to show it to Square. That was the start. The plans weren't very appealing, though, and it had honestly been rough going. Sorry, no robots. I kept being told that. It was right after the bubble had broken, so everything was kind of slumped and frozen. We're sorry, but game development can no longer afford to be driven by the creator's passions alone. That was something I heard a lot. It was difficult to say, on paper, how far we could take this idea for a robot game. At this time too, Square had made games 100% in-house, and concerns were raised about outsourcing game development since, well, after all, this was the company that made Final Fantasy, Second Densetsu, and Romancing Saga to that point. Additionally, opinions at Square were mixed about creating a more realistic game based on robots. But it may have been this fact in particular that eventually had Square greenlight this new franchise. The two points that brought people around were, one, that Square's previous work had all been in the fantasy genre, and two, that doing something new would actually be good stimulation for the staff at Square. For Square's part, it can potentially get monotonous to go straight to the next sequel in their mainline series, so I think this experience was stimulating for their staff. This quote is from Shinji Hashimoto, who is credited as another producer for the game and can be seen as Sushida's right-hand man. Hashimoto would be instrumental in helping make Front Mission a reality by creating a company called Solid that acted as an organizational intermediary between Square and G-Craft. Hashimoto also became a sounding board for the story of Front Mission 1 working closely with Sushida and a few others to codify the rules of the Front Mission universe and create the characters to inhabit it. Interestingly, Hashimoto gained his belief for this project after the staff at G-Craft made a sample movie of the game using a Macintosh program. If they go through all this trouble just for a video demo, he thought, imagine what they could do with a full budget and full team. Seeing the passion and possibilities behind the project, Square eventually decided to come on as publisher. Plans for the game were completed in 1993, and the game was sent into production, with G-Craft taking the lead and Square assisting with some development tasks. The game went into development with grand ideas that would greatly influence the gameplay and thematic character of the final product. Over the course of its development, a few interesting and important development focuses started to come up. The first of which is the Wanzer and character designs. A concept that Sushida wanted to implement was to have very detailed battle and assembly animations for the Wanzers, and it took up a large part of the development time. If you've played the game, you'll immediately know about the long periods of time you'll spend in the assembly stage, tinkering with parts, comparing weapon statistics, looking over pilot details, and upgrading your Wanzers. One designer in particular worked on Wanzer designs, but everyone on the team was encouraged to give input that the team called a Wanzerosophy. This built a huge number of parts and weapons into the game, as each member of the team was able to give some creative insight into the look and feel of the parts. Looking through a GameFAQ document on all the parts and weapons available, you can see just how vast the possibilities are in the game, and how there's an endless ability to tinker and plan each mech. Contrary to what you might think when looking at this list of parts though, 
simplicity was a feature that the team aimed for. The goal was to allow players to instinctively tell character capabilities and roles without having to consult a strategy guide or think about minute details. And while there is a level up system, the feeling the devs wanted to get across was that equipping and learning the Wanzer itself, like a character in a traditional RPG, is more important than base stats. Sushita said, We also tried to remove confusing or opaque stats. I didn't want Front Mission to be something you have to read a strategy guide to understand. It should be simple. Instead of crunching stats and numbers, we tried to make it something where you could tell at a simple glance what was stronger or weaker. If I'm honest, I'm not sure this was achieved as Sushita intended, and I find it hard to really understand some of the math behind the game and frequently needed to compare long lists of parts to understand how to upgrade my units. We'll look in much more depth at all the parts a little bit later, but just keep in mind that it's not the most efficient or easy process to just simply upgrade your units. The GCraft team worked closely with development teams at Square, and as the Front Mission project grew, so did the time and input of Square developers and programmers who were loaned over to the project to help with the lofty goals. Even still, the visual presentation of the final product fell a little short of the standard Sushita had, which he partially blamed on the Super Famicom hardware limitations and on the time the team had to split between near obsessively tweaking the gameplay. The amount of programming data in Front Mission was indeed huge. There were so many dialogue and character options that bugs were still being fixed less than a month before the deadline, with one programmer in particular saying he was really worried about how the final project would turn out. The font and dialogue boxes had to be hand-programmed because of the large amount of text that would appear on screen. 300 people eventually play-tested the game, with interest given to main characters Sakata, Driscoll, and Hands. Surprising to the producer duo of Hashimoto and Sushida, women playtesters loved the game, even though it was pretty dense on the war imagery and gritty realism. Hashimoto also made sure to note that the playtesters who worked on Chrono Trigger gave the game nice praise and a few good pieces of positive feedback. An early prototype ROM of the game was then sent out to journalists, but was simplified and tuned after with some additional feedback. One thing that definitely stands out in Front Mission is the artistic style of the box art and characters. Yoshitaka Amano designed the character portraits and helped create the overall art style for the game. If that name looks familiar, it's because Amano was instrumental in creating the style and conceptual design that gave early Final Fantasy games their distinctive feel. Amano began his career working as a freelance illustrator for sci-fi and fantasy novels, and was hired by Square in 1987 on the basis of his work. He would work on a long list of games, providing artistic direction, illustrations, character portraits, and working on the manuals and box art. Even though he stepped down as the lead character designer and artist in 1994, he still provided Square with materials in a freelance capacity. These materials included the character artwork, box and title designs that are seen in Front Mission and Front Mission Gun Hazard. Amano did up to 40 character illustrations, allowing the developers to choose who best represented the image they had for each main character in the game. Development manager Tetsuya Takahashi said, We originally had different graphics for the faces, I really liked them myself, but they had to be changed. Reworking Amano's illustrations to fit the atmosphere we were going for was very difficult. Hashimoto said, That was my request, as the producer. Because Front Mission's story is so dark and heavy, you know, with pictures of human brains and all, I felt it was important to have a few light-hearted, more cheerful images to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. You can see some of that in the commercial we aired. 
the other places of Mono's illustrations. I told him I thought it would be good to have a couple images of the characters without his usual dark expressions and scowls. Amano said he was bad at those kind of drawings, but he did manage to create two for us nonetheless. More than just being artwork though, the characters themselves were meant to be an important aspect of the game. The characters' interdependence and trust was often highlighted in the game, and the fact that the characters formed a paramilitary freelance organization meant that a wide array of personalities and backgrounds could be brought into the game. The team grows over the course of Front Mission, and by the end, there's quite a large group to choose from. Characters were nonetheless meant to have natural personalities, and lots of thought was put into making them have realistic choices based on these personalities. Sushita said, That's right, this was something that emerged from conversations with Sakaguchi. The idea that a game about robots would be ripe for a story about human drama. That was his idea, and in this game, themed around war, we should try and include human drama as well. Sakaguchi, another developer for the game, responded with, I said, let's not abandon or compromise on the tasteful, refined aesthetic that the G-Craft team has created, but let's see if we can include some human drama that would evoke the realism of war. In that sense, I think Front Mission ended up becoming a very mature, adult game. Keep in mind again that I am working off a fan-translated English patch for Front Mission 1, but from what I understand, it keeps a little bit closer to the beats of the original Japanese game. When the game was brought over to the Nintendo DS, it was given an official English translation, but this translation toned some things down and censored some of the dialogue of a few of the main characters. Still though, you can see some of this character development even within the first few missions of the game where Lloyd comes across as brash and arrogant in the opening battle and sees his fiance killed on what should have been a standard reconnaissance mission. Witnessing this seems to soften him and bring out a more compassionate side of Lloyd that's still balanced out with a sort of flawed and unhinged character personality that he brings up throughout some of the missions. He's definitely not meant to be a knight in shining armor as the official translation sort of paints him to be. Okay, so with the development and background out of the way, we can start to look a bit deeper at Front Mission 1, the story and the gameplay. I find that this game really is a perfect blend of gameplay and narrative that lifts a simple gaming experience into something bigger. Like the developers wanted, it's a character-driven story, but one that isn't shy to take on bigger themes too. Thematically, the story deals with loss, both of friends and of the sanity of some of the characters. It deals with themes of war and how the men and women who fight in wars are sometimes just pawns for the larger machinery going on in the background. There seems to be a strong sense of family in the game too, trying to define what this is and how people grow together and rely on each other even in difficult times. Even with these interesting themes and directions, the story never feels overdone or larger than it should be. It tends to be almost sparse at times and gives the player just enough to keep the main ideas fresh without trying to incorporate more story than is necessary. I'd really say that it is almost a masterstroke in storytelling. Front Mission 1 takes place on a fictional Pacific island called Huffman. You can sort of think of it as something close to Hawaii. Huffman was created by Volcanic Activity in 1995, and by 2002 was classified as an island and given over to the United Nations control. In 2020, the United States of the New Continent, the new unified supercontinent of North and South America, withdrew from the United Nations and submitted a motion to the UN, OCU, and the European community, proposing that Huffman Island be treated as their territory. The OCU disputed this claim after both superpowers started colonizing the island in 2065. 
Tensions on the island grew over the subsequent five years, leading to the first Huffman conflict in 2070, which was concluded when both sides agreed to split the island in two. Peace was never really meant to last, though, and skirmishes started to break out again in 2086, leading to the Huffman Crisis, when both sides sent in peacekeeping forces to quell the violence. It all comes to a head, though, in 2090, the year when the story of Front Mission 1 starts, precipitated by the Larkus Incident, an event that happens when an OCU reconnaissance unit is ambushed by the USN, who then blow up a factory and blame the destruction on the OCU. The main character in the game is, as I'll call him, Lloyd Clive, which is the name in my translation, and he's the man who led the recon unit that was there at the Larkus incident. His fiance Karen is killed in the raid, and to make things worse, the OCU blames the events on Lloyd and discharges him from the military. When the game gets going again, Lloyd is now a freelance pilot, making money competing in Wanzer Coliseums across Huffman Island. He's found by a man named Olsen, and offered a mercenary contract to help track down the people responsible for the Larkus incident and the death of his fiance, all while helping the OCU army in their march across the island. From the beginning, you're also joined by Ryuji Sakata, who is with you in the original prologue mission and becomes a very important character in the game, and Natalie, a female Wanzer pilot whose father you later learn is a general. From here on out, I'm going to get pretty far into the plot specifics, so if you want to play the game, which of course I recommend, then skip to the time displayed on the screen to bypass any story spoilers. Okay, so, after the Larkus incident, Lloyd goes on to join the Carrion Crows mercenary outfit, led by Olsen, which becomes tangled up in the war in Huffman. After a few missions for Olsen, Lloyd is told to stay put in the city of Milligan and await further orders. However, a Coliseum fighter named Yang finds Lloyd in the city and tells him that she saw his fiancée in the hospital just two months prior. She tells Lloyd that if he can beat her in a match, she'll spill the beans and eventually lets him know the location of the hospital. When the Carrion Crows make it there, Driscoll, the main enemy from the game's prologue, is evacuating the hospital and thwarts Lloyd's efforts to find Karen. Over the next batch of missions, you slowly move further into USN territory and liberate their cities in support of the main army. As you do this, the background of a few characters begins to unravel. Yang, a character who believes she lost her brother in the war, finds him and brings him back to safety, mirroring the larger story of Lloyd and Karen. You meet a character named Mari, who's defending her bombed out town and joins the Carrion Crows because she blames Lloyd for the war and wants to watch him die. Bobby and Perunga are fighting in the streets, and after you break it up, they say how they were just sparring and ask to join your team. You learn too that Natalie's father is an influential general, and that Sakata's brother is a president of another nation and his father, an influential Wanzer scientist. About three quarters of the way through the game, after defending Sakata's father from Gents and a group of terrorists, the war comes to an end, bringing what is ostensibly the main plot point of the game to a close. The OSU and the USN bring in an arbiter to help settle the war, and after some suicidal resistance from USN pilots, an uneasy peace is once again brokered with the Carrion Crows at one point having to work alongside Driscoll. However, this is obviously not the end of the story, and you begin to uncover secrets about a new and powerful Wanzer design that implants actual human brains into the mechanics of a Wanzer to create an almost cybernetic hybrid. In an attempt to learn more about this technology, the Carrion Crows go rogue, seeing three of your earliest allies, JJ and Keith and Natalie, leaving to side with Olsen, while Lloyd enlists the aid of the now vindicated Gents. A showdown with Driscoll in the Nirvana Project Factory sees him giving the full story of the technology, 
technology that was created by Sakata's father and used by Sakata's brother to gain more power on the island. The entire war was falsely created as an opportunity to find candidates for the project and then to test the new weapon, with blame being cast on Lloyd and his team to get global authorities off the trail. Driscoll then drops the big twist of the game, that his Wanzer is powered by the brain of Karen, Lloyd's fiance from the prologue of the game. The Carrion Crows are now completely rogue and must battle across the island to continue their mission, but are one point caught by Olsen, Natalie, JJ, and Keith. The latter three, in the end, choose to back up Lloyd. Natalie lets him know that she knew the whole story from the start and was placed in the Carrion Crows to keep an eye on Lloyd and Sakata. Over the next few missions, you find that Sakata's brother masterminded the entire project and kills his father when he tries to flee. The final battle sees the Carrion Crows take a helicopter to an underground facility off the coast of Huffman Island to fight against Sakata and Driscoll, who is in the S-Device prototype, the full realization of the project started by Sakata Industries. After defeating Driscoll and destroying the base, the Carrion Crows disband. Sakata leaves to think about what his family has done. JJ returns to his family in Africa, while Keith decides to go to Africa as well to begin fighting in a new war. Natalie goes to find her father and help him rebuild his reputation, while Gents returns to his plans to help rebuild Huffman Island, and he asks Lloyd to join him. Lloyd agrees to work with Gents, but only after taking time away and a chance to bury Karen for good. The final cinematic montage of the game is really impactful, and the final lines written by Frederick, who's one of the playable characters, really ties up the main theme of the game too. A theme that the bigger powers of the world can play their games with the individual soldiers being almost expendable resources used to cover up their schemes. It's a pretty cynical closing, if I must say, but brings a surprise level of closure to the story. Story in subsequent games would see Ryuji Sakata, JJ, and Keith reunite with Lloyd, who himself would never find peace and suffer from PTSD after the war, being again recruited into a mercenary unit and showing up in Front Mission 2, along with having a brief cameo in Front Mission 5. So far we've gone over the world of Front Mission, some of the background and development, along with the story and brief mention of the characters. But what is the game actually like to play? We can start by being as reductionist as possible, and as you've no doubt noticed by now, say that Front Mission is a tactical RPG, and one with a focus on slow progression and strategy. The game has a very deliberate pace, and individual missions can take as long as an hour to complete. The slow pace, though, means that tactical decisions, based on whatever the mission tends to be asking for, are really important, as are choosing your movements carefully and using weapons in a logical way. The slow pace extends to between missions too, though, where even something as simple as outfitting your mechs takes quite a bit of time. What happens around the mission as the story begins to build and take shape does a great job of pulling you into the game world. Front Mission has a very quick start to it. It begins with some exposition, bringing you up to where the story begins, and then throws you right into the prologue mission. Once this prologue mission is complete, you start to gain access to the various cities around the island of Huffman. 
Each city has a shop to buy new parts and weapons, a bar to talk to other characters and find leads on pilots to recruit to your team, a coliseum to try out mech configurations, win money, and slowly grind XP, and an office where Lloyd's team finds their missions. These in-between sequences of the game make the world feel a lot more like a living and breathing place though, and the character art of Amano gives each character you meet an independent feel. The bar is a nice place to visit. The various people you meet will cue you into small details of the world and the larger political happenings on the island of Huffman. This was always meant to be a character-driven game, and as a result, there are a ton of characters to unlock and add to your team. According to an FAQ I read, there are a total of 17, some of which are not unlocked through normal progression and have to be tracked down. In my playthrough, I only got 15 characters, so I missed out on two. Main characters join at various times, and a few have larger parts to play in the overall story. Some characters will leave your unit for a little while too, for any number of reasons, but return later. There is however not permadeath, and characters that get knocked out in battle won't be gone forever, but instead just require a repair fee that eats into your profits so there is still reason to not be totally reckless with your mechs. However, you do get an instant game over if the main character is killed in battle. As I mentioned briefly before, even through this translation patch, the characters seem fleshed out and have their own personalities. Lloyd, haunted by the death of his fiancée and the war that he thinks he caused, goes from being a harsh disciplinarian in the opening prologue to a much more rounded and forgiving character after, if not one who's a bit mentally disturbed and haunted by his failures. Natalie struggles with her duties and ties to the military, ultimately choosing friendship over loyalty to a bad cause. Characters like JJ and Keith bring a bit of levity and humor to the game, while Hans fills the role of the computer genius hacker type. Watching the arc of the various characters transpire was something I was not totally prepared for, but really quite enjoyed. Outfitting and tinkering with mechs ends up being one of the bigger parts of the game, and well, it kind of wears out its welcome as you get further along. Like I mentioned in the section on the development of the game, members of the team were encouraged to give feedback and designs to the main developer in charge of creating the weapons and parts in the game, and it seems like it just ended up as overload. There are so many parts and weapons in the game, and each new city will have four or five new body arm leg combos and up to ten weapons. Generally I would buy the most expensive stuff I could for parts, and really only stray if certain stats of certain pieces fit better with a fighter or a long-range unit as an example. It can really make your head spin trying to figure it all out though. It's a lot of number crunching and comparing and it's necessary to make upgrades after almost every single stage. Managing weight is always a concern, especially in the early game before backpacks become available, but there's an abundance of weapons with very incremental stat changes between them. To explain the weapons in the game, it's good to start with an overview of how weapons can be equipped, which is either on the shoulders or in the hands. The shoulder units are missile launchers and shields. A character's stat in long affects how well the character will do with launchers, and skill and agility will make blocking with shields or guarding more effective. Launchers have a long range, as you'd expect, anywhere from two to four squares out from your unit to much further. This makes launchers great for chipping away at enemies as they come into range or as you move forward to attack. Launchers became so effective that I would end up equipping one on any unit I could as long as it fit. The only drawback to launchers is that they run out of bullets, but there's usually enough to make it through a mission without having to refit in the middle of it. As the long stat for each of your characters grows, too, you eventually learn a guide skill that lets you choose a part to target and makes character with the long skill even more powerful. 
In my playthrough, I made the main character Lloyd a long specialist, and he could effectively kill anything in one turn with his launchers by specifically targeting the body. I read from some others who played the game that the short skill is the most effective in the later part of the game, but I really found the long stat to be the most powerful throughout the whole game pretty much. Short weapons are things like rifles or shotguns, which are single shot but really powerful, or machine guns that fire multiple bullets but at a much lower damage ratio. I should say too that each weapon in the game has a hit characteristic. The higher this hit characteristic, the more likely it will hit the enemy you're aiming at. The skills you get throughout the game make the short weapons even more effective though. One of the skills gives you the ability to target a specific part, which lets you chip away either with the rifle or machine gun. Another skill allows you to switch out weapons to fire from both arms, switching from your left arm to your right arm within one turn. Natalie is one of the first characters to join the Carrion Crows and became one of my most destructive when she learned her skills to target the body and then switch from her machine gun to rifle in the same turn. I'd say, in general though, that machine guns are best for peppering an enemy and trying to reduce the HP of multiple parts, instead of giving the all-or-nothing attack of a rifle or a shotgun. The last stat, Fight, ended up being one of my favorite in the game, and is used for characters who use mechs in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can equip them with batons or fight stick sort of things, but arm parts themselves have a base damage that quickly outperforms handheld weapons. One of my favorite characters in the game is Yang, a powerful fight character, and after she learned the skill to attack with both fists one right after the other in a single turn, she made up the core of the squad I would take into every battle and murdered enemy wanzers like clockwork. As I started to get further into the game, the sheer amount of combinations and units started to really confuse me, so I color-coded each unit based on what I intended to use them for. For example, black was used for long specialists, red was for fighters, and blue was for short-range attackers with the double skill, while yellow was for short fight hybrids and green for short long. This helped me keep the battlefield a little more organized and broken into groups so that I could maneuver them better on the battlefield. I talked briefly about parts already, but that's another interesting aspect of equipping mechs. Like I mentioned, there's four different parts, body, legs, and left and right arm. Well, in addition to a backpack unit, which increases the weight you can carry, and a computer, which increases base stats. But neither of these really have that much bearing in an actual battle, with body, arms, and legs being a mechanic you have to manage much more closely. Reducing the body to zero HP will destroy the mech as a whole, where reducing the legs to zero will decrease movement range, and blowing off arms will remove the attack equipped to it. For your own units, this means sometimes losing your ability to move or attack. There are items that can repair parts, or you can visit Peewee. Peewee is a character you meet early in the game who eventually joins your team. He drives a supply truck and is really indispensable. When you move to one of the spaces around Peewee, he will repair a totally broken part back to low HP, so you can use a repair kit to bring it back to working order. More importantly though, Peewee can resupply your launchers, meaning that if you run out of bullets, you can retreat to his supply truck to stock back up. Peewee is not explained very well in the game itself, but through some experimentation, I began to realize how much of a god on earth he is. The mapping and level design is another thing that really stands out in Front Mission. The maps themselves are all grid-based, and each character has a movement stat based on the parts that you equip. The game does a great job of changing up the scenery of levels, though. You'll fight in city streets and deserts, across forests with trees that block your path, 
through mountainscapes with uneven terrain, making movement and targeting a challenge, and through warehouses and underground facilities. One of my favorite levels involved crossing a river with a bridge on one side for faster movement, but guarded by heavy hitting missilers. You attack at one point through a fortress and must destroy massive siege guns as you move through the various levels of the fort. Every level in the game is completed by destroying all the enemies, but sometimes there are additional mechanics, like defending a specific unit, taking out enemies within a turn limit, or destroying certain elements on the map to continue. Another complication in the maps are things like trees, cars, and buildings that'll block your path and force you to bottleneck to certain parts of the map. In addition to this though, certain maps have large differences in terrain, making them hilly or mountainous as an example. I don't know if I was able to completely figure out how this mechanic works, but it seems like large drops in terrain will make it so that short weapons no longer work and you can only target with long. The maps though just show the amount of care and time that the team took with the game. There's probably over a dozen map types, and each has a different battle animation background. They could have just recycled a few over and over and over again, but instead they really went overboard, and it makes each stage feel different and believable and a bit more personal than if they just recycled the same assets over and over again. What makes each individual battle so much fun to play though is the sheer amount of units deployed and the size of the maps. Your own squad will range anywhere from 5 units up to all 17, but the enemy can sometimes call in as many as 20 units. The battlefield fills up as a result and reminds me a bit more of the large scale tactical RPGs like Shining Force rather than the smaller scale or more intimate battles of something like Final Fantasy Tactics. You get the really cool combat animations for each attack too, though they can sometimes be a little monotonous, especially in earlier parts of a battle where you trade long shots with the enemy. You always start first though, and are allowed to issue orders to every unit before the bad guys get their turn. Bringing up the enemy does allow me to talk about one of my biggest criticisms with the game, and that's the difficulty. Front Mission actually starts off a bit hard, and really forces you to learn the game quickly. But after a few missions and upgrades, it starts to get really, really easy, and I found it possible to beat most levels without losing a unit. Some difficulty comes from the randomness of the attacks with weapons having a high chance of missing, but if you keep grinding XP and tuning your mechs, it's easy to get around this problem. The biggest problem though is just the AI itself. Enemy units seem to gang up and prioritize attacking your unit with the lowest HP, not necessarily the one with the highest threat. What this means is that the enemies may shoot away at the broken and crumbling husk of your weakest ally, with no weapons left and only a body part remaining, all while overlooking the fully HP'd red mech rushing towards them with two fists ready to get stuck in. Additionally, they tend to run away pretty regularly to rebuild their mechs at mobile bases, giving an opportunity to chip away with launchers from a distance. The AI in the game is just unfortunately pretty dumb. It never attacks in swarms or focuses attacks effectively, meaning most of the units can be eaten away at one by one with minimal effort. What I love about tactical RPGs is the one more turn feeling you get when playing through a map, and that is completely evident in Front Mission. Front Mission may have a slower pace and lots of stat comparison and some wonky AI, but I still absolutely loved playing the game, and may honestly go so far as to say it's a top 10 game for the Super Nintendo for me. It plays so smoothly, and I was continually impressed by the presentation, with things like graphics and music that I didn't really talk about being excellent as well. 
For how deep the gameplay is, the story is rather sparse, and I actually quite liked that. There was just enough story and character development to keep things interesting without overdoing it like sometimes happens in other RPGs. I was genuinely shocked by some of the twists in the game too. The story ended up being really impactful overall. The difficulty, that is again on the easier side, made the whole experience almost a little bit relaxing. I never felt too stressed out or on edge while playing, but was able to take the game in and enjoy the story and pace while chipping away at the 20-ish or so hour playtime. Front Mission would get two different ports that would expand the game significantly. The first ports would actually show up on the Japanese Wondrous Wan Color in 2002, and it was pretty much the same as the Super Famicom game except on a handheld. The big 2003 port to the PS1, called Front Mission First, is where the game would start to see some major revisions. This port updated the graphics and animations, bringing it closer to the look that Tsushida originally wanted, but was unable to implement on the Super Famicom hardware. It also added a new scenario to play through, through the eyes of the USN, who were the antagonists in the original release. Apart from the new missions, the USN scenario is considered to be a difficulty upgrade over the original game. Additionally, two characters that would later be seen in Front Mission 4 were added to the game. The PS1 port served as the basis for the Nintendo DS version, which is the first time the game was available outside of Japan and features an official English translation. The DS version makes use of the dual screen setup for ease and gameplay and allows the game to be sped up. New characters from other Front Mission games were added into this version as well, along with new weapons, parts, wanzers, and nine secret missions that expanded the original storyline. For a long time, the Nintendo DS version was the easiest way to play the game in North America, but that changed in 2022 with the release of Front Mission First Remake which is an HD remaster of the game with improved controls and some added modern touches. It seems that this remake got kind of average reviews, and it might be better to just play the original if you're able to get a ROM version with the translation patch. Immediately after Front Mission 1, Sushida and G-Craft began work on Front Mission 2, while Gun Hazard, a game we'll look at in a separate video, was being created. For Front Mission 2, Tsushida would return as director for the game, and it would be produced at the same time as Front Mission Alternative, which was another spin-off game like Gun Hazard, and features real-time strategy gameplay, not the turn-based tactical RPG style of the numbered Front Mission games. During production of Front Mission 2, Tsushida was approached by Square, who offered to buy out and incorporate G-Craft into Square itself. The deal took place during development, and G-Craft was renamed Square Development Division 6. Front Mission 2 was the last game produced under the G-Craft name, but it was a massive success in Japan, selling over 500,000 copies and receiving a gold prize from Sony in May of 1998. Apparently, a reason it was never released outside of Japan is due to certain storylines and word choices that the producers feared would be considered vulgar or taboo in North America. Sushida would stay on as director and writer for Front Mission 2, 3, and 4 before giving up director duties for Front Mission 5 and acting just as a producer. Our friend Hashimoto would work as producer for many Front Mission games as well. Front Mission 5, Scars of War, released in Japan only in 2005, was the last numbered game released in the series. The stories of each Front Mission game were meant to be serialized and standalone to a point, but Front Mission 5 brought them all together and served as a final tie-up for all the loose ends and inconsistencies that came up from the previous games. The commercial and critical flop Left Alive, released in 2019, was actually set in the Front Mission universe, unfortunately, but 
Other than that, the last Front Mission game to see a North American release was the online multiplayer third-person Front Mission Evolved, released to the Xbox 360 in 2010. I've talked a lot about Front Mission already and don't want to draw out a super long conclusion. I will say though, keep your eyes open for the Front Mission Gun Hazard video, which I'll be releasing soon and will be a shorter addendum to this longer one. I will say that as a writer, if that's something I can consider myself, sometimes the introduction and conclusion are the hardest things to write. The conclusion especially, how do you bookend and pull together the ideas that you at least attempted to present in a meaningful way? Even now, I'm rewriting this about a year after writing the script and re-recording chunks of the video. This was a hard one for me to get off the ground. I think a reason for this, though, is I fear I won't do this game justice. A video could be made entirely about the story, a story that feels deep and personal without ever being melodramatic. It's a story that's at times sparse, but also gives the detail to make it emotional and make me feel a deep connection with the characters and the world. And it lines up perfectly too with gameplay that is deep, enjoyable, pretty to look at, and a joy to listen to. Front Mission 1 is one of those examples in gaming where all the parts fit together so perfectly and so expertly that it elevates this little hobby of ours to something larger than just what fits on a game cartridge. As I mentioned before, to me this is an absolute must-play for the Super Nintendo, and I absolutely recommend you give it a try. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today. I really appreciate it, especially if you stuck through to the end of it and heard my little conclusion. Keep your eyes open for the next video in this small series. Otherwise, I hope to see you back here again soon. Take care.